Hello and welcome to It Started With A Kick, the podcast in which well-known fans, high-profile figures from football and also ex-players talk about the first match they played in, attended, etc. I'm your host, Richard Foster, and I'm absolutely delighted to introduce today's guest, Jim Beglin. Jim started his playing career joining Shamrock Rovers as a teenager from his hometown, Waterford, before moving to the mighty Liverpool a few years later as Bob Paisley's last signing for the princely sum of £20,000. At Anfield, he was part of the double-winning team in 1985-86, but unfortunately the following season, Jim was badly injured, and although he did move to Leeds, Leeds and featured in the team that won the second division title in 1990 under Howard Wilkinson, and also played 15 times for Ireland, he was forced to retire at the rather tender age of 27. So, Jim... A warm welcome to It Started With A Kick, and we've got a few matches to discuss. So let's kick off with your Shamrock Rovers debut. Yeah, um, I played against St. Patrick's Athletic at um, Glen Malure Park, which was our home mill town, it was called. Um, mm-hmm. And they were city rivals, Dublin city rivals. Um, and I can remember being fairly nervous um, they had a superstar in League of Ireland terms playing for them called Jackie Jameson and I was hoping he would keep well away from me he was a really tall guy with wonderful skill but I, I kind of concentrated on not making a mistake on, on just yeah. trying to get through it as opposed to trying to you know to dazzle I thought well if I go out and start kind of doing indiscipline and stuff uh, maybe get a bit carried away, it might backfire on me. So I just want to come through with something solid. And I think it was based on what I've been told. I think it was a decent debut. And um, yeah, it, it, it started my run. So were you left back for this game or what was your position? Yeah, there was, there was a guy, um, I can't remember his surname, Joe. I remember there was a Joe who was playing left back. He's a small guy. He was quite quick. Mm-hmm. And he got injured. And right. I had gone to Shamrock Rovers as a centre-back. Um, and I was kind of a little unsure of the position. But, you know, they, they broke it down for me and said, look, this this is what we want from you. This is what we want you to do. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a very good manager at the time in Johnny Giles, who'd yes. left West Brom and come back. And with the Kilcoyne family in, in Dublin, they tried to get all the best young talent around Ireland and maybe create a side that was good enough to compete in Europe and then mm-hmm. maybe sell the players on for, for good profit. It never quite materialised in, in that way. But um, but the football we played was was lovely. And I seem to enjoy the, the kind of the, the, the forward motion I was able to get by playing at left back. Mm-hmm. And uh, it just carried on from there. I mean, I... I I kept my place in the side and um, poor Joe, I don't think ever, ever got back in before he was, he was moved on. Right. Okay. So how old were you when you made this debut? I was, I think I was 18, maybe 17. Maybe, maybe I hadn't just turned 18. Maybe I was still about 17. I am in, in Ireland, the, football season for the junior leagues um, all began on the 1st of August and I my birthday is the 29th of July so I was two days away from you know being there maybe a, a, a year later um, so I always felt I, I was kind of swimming against the tide in terms of like the, the age I was up against mm. and I, I had played in a tournament in Cannes for the Ireland under I, I think it was under 18 it was an under mm-hmm. 18 competition and when I actually went there I was 15 I was 15 and okay. it was the year I was doing my leaving certificate um, at school and my parents weren't delighted about the fact that I was going <laughs> away for eight days yeah. to Cannes in the south of France but Johnny Giles was overseeing all of that and um, he had a coach called Eamon Dunphy who was quite famous yes. legendary on Irish yeah. TV and I remember as I was in Nice airport and we were flying back to Dublin um, he pulled me to one side and he he offered me terms he offered me a, a, a professional contract mm-hmm. and 
I mean, that that grabbed me. My parents came with me to see Johnny Giles in, in Dublin subsequently. Um, and then I was I was kind of I was off and running from there. And it, it was it was great grounding for me because Giles was a hard taskmaster. I mean, he, he didn't um, he, 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 he would never really kind of soften things up. He he, he always saw, saw things in a very kind of professional manner. And you basically had to adhere to the advice or, you know, you wouldn't get very far. Mm -hmm. um, and he, he hardened me. He toughened me up. He got me ready for, for the whole kind of professional system. And, yeah. you know, by the time I went on trial to Liverpool, eventually I went on a month's loan. Um, I was kind of, I, I was hardened and I was ready for the challenge. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting because I would imagine... Johnny Giles from the, you know, the school of Don Reavy, who, you know, he, he was quite hard nosed as well. And, yeah. you know, when you're 17 or 18, I would imagine most of the other players for both Shamrock Rovers and St. Patrick's were probably a lot older than that. So it was, you know, a boys amongst men. Um, and I remember I've also had Stuart Robson on this podcast and he talked about he made his debut for Arsenal uh, aged similar, 17, 18, but it, at Upton Park, which was, you know, quite a lively ground. He said, you know, he was nervous. He also was introduced as, because he went to public school, he was the toff. Uh, and they gave him a little bit of flack. But he said that most of the players were very good to him and were quite welcoming. But I'd imagine there are a few sort of hardened professionals who just give you quite a hard time when you're a teenager. Yeah, I, I can remember there was no sympathy um, afforded to me um, because we had very different training drills and it really tested your ability on the ball. Um, mm -hmm. You know, with, like taking the ball around cones and all that kind of stuff and, you know, dribbling in and out. And, and they'd be broken into little teams, little groups. And if if you if you failed at all, if you knocked a bollard over, for example, you know, or a cone, you you um, had to basically give up five or six seconds in in the whole process, and right. and that would be really costly. And that happened to me a few times, and I I was treated harshly by by some of the senior pros at the time. I mean, it was a professional system. Most of the mm -hmm. League of Ireland then was part time, but it yeah. was a professional system at Shamrock Rovers. There were part-time players, but for all the young guys that had been signed, they were they were all fully professional. Mm -hmm. And um and we we were treated harshly as I I, I refer to and uh, yeah, it was an eye opener for me. I I realized that I'm going to have to kind of step up the grade if I'm going to be able to kind of play with these guys and and compete against um some of them too in training. Yeah. So what I wanted to move on to is your next first match, if you like, which was your first European game, which you had to travel all the way to Reykjavik for. So do you have clear memories of that? I mean, that must have been an amazing experience because you weren't much older then and it must have been, oh, I'm off to Iceland here. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the game wasn't exactly... Um anything dramatic but we we, we had a, a hell of a night out uh, after after we uh, <laughs> we, we finished you I, can right of it. <laughs> I can remember it for that you yeah. know um but i i think um from Reykjavik, if memory serves me right um and mm -hmm. i think it's still an irish record in in european competition because we yeah. won 7-0 on aggregate and i don't think any other uh, irish team has ever has ever got close to that um, maybe I'm wrong at this stage. No, no, no. I can I can verify that as someone as a journalist. Okay. I did check that because I saw it, and it is true. Seven nil is the highest aggregate for an Irish team in European yeah. competition. So you got that in your CV straight away, which is quite handy. Yeah, well, it's, it's quite nice. But I mean, I, I can remember the game at. Um, I remember both a little bit, but I remember the game at um, at home, mm. and then um, we had you know quite a good crowd. Gene goes on, and I think we left it fairly late, if memory serves me right, in terms of the, the, the goals we scored. But yeah, um, but yeah, I, I ended up with one, and I think it was I did the same against Limerick once upon a time. I think basically I got lucky on a wayward cross, right? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I just stepped up the pitch, and 
we we had two very good strikers in that team who went on to play in Belgium and Spain, both of them, oh, okay. respectively. Right. And um, Alan Campbell and Liam Buckley. And Liam Buckley was a brilliant header of the ball. And I always looked to try and pick him out. And mm-hmm. I can remember, you know, just looking to, to do so again. Yeah. And the ball just seemed to kind of float away. And um, mm-hmm. it just drifted into the far corner. The keeper misjudged it. And, um, you know, I, I got lucky. But, of course, you know, I told everybody afterwards I meant it. Shades of Ronaldinho against England at the World yeah. Cup. Yeah, just one of those yeah. drifts over the keeper. Yeah. 2002, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, well, actually, you mentioned both Campbell and Buckley scored. I mean, Campbell scored in the game in Reykjavik and Buckley scored in the game, the home game. So, you, you're right. I mean, when I look at it, it, it was a UEFA Cup first round. So, the first leg in Reykjavik. Um the stadium, I, I, I don't know. It's called the Lagerslöslo. Sorry, Icelandic people. That probably wasn't very good. Um, and it had a uh, capacity of five. Well, no, five hundred sixty-seven people turned up because you know Iceland's not a huge country. Uh, yeah, they're very into their football, and they've proved it to England a couple of times. But it, it, it looked. I looked at the lineups for the first game. There are a lot of sons in the Icelandic team. In fact, every single one. I don't know. It is a, a convention, isn't it? Their name. Yeah. So your son of son, son, son. Um, and just looking at your team, you know the Shamrock team. Um, so you you do have Liam Buckley. You've got Alan Campbell. Did any of these? You say they went on to Belgium, Spain. Did any of the other players? So Peter Eccles, Jacka Madonna, Ronnie Murphy. Did they go on to? leave Shamrock and go out of Ireland or most of them stayed with Yeah, Ireland. I think Jacko McDonough went and played in the second division in France. And we okay. had a guy called who was a left back uh, like me. I think he more or less replaced me once once mm. I, I'd left. Uh, John Cody, who played for Chelsea oh, for, right. for, for a little bit. So, I mean, we, we had in, 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 in that whole kind of philosophy of the Kilcoyne family and John Giles, we had some great talent. I mean, we we played some wonderful football because Johnny Giles just basically loved to kind of pass and move, and and you know he was a great passer of the football. Um, but we'd always succumb to the more experienced sides at the time, like Dundalk and Athlone. You know that the, they're the, the the senior players they had and the strength, um, and and all that experience. And you know we we we'd get close, but we'd never quite be able to to win the league. Uh, under under Johnny Giles, I think as soon as I left, they won four in a row. Right, they took on new management, and it all changed, and um, you know everything took off. But but I I, I would you know always tell uh, people I'm forever grateful for my stint at Shamrock Rovers, which didn't go down well in my hometown once they realised I was signing from because there was a kind of a rivalry between Waterford and Shamrock Rovers oh, that right. wasn't yeah. necessarily too friendly. And um, I, I don't think it was kind of well received. And there was all sorts of nonsense went round in Waterford that I was asking for too much money and, you know, absolute BS. Um, I, I went for next to nothing, you know, and by the time I paid my digs in Dublin, I was I, pr- I was pretty much broke. So um, but I knew it was a means to to better things and higher places. And that's why I, I uh, made the move. Yeah, so... Moving from Waterford to Shamrock Rovers, maybe like living from Liverpool to Man United or vice versa. The fans probably don't enjoy that very much because they're they're you know bitter rivals. So yeah. you know we know about rivalry in football. It exists. Sometimes it goes slightly over the top, but you know you've got to have rivals. Otherwise, you know we're not not be friends with everyone, are you? You do, but I mean Shamrock Rovers, big rivals, if I may say so, weren't. You know, it wasn't Waterford or, or no. any of, of, of um, anything outside Dublin. It's basically Bohemians. And it's, you know, Dublin is split into the north side and the south side. And the Liffey mm. is between the River Liffey. Um, and Bohemians was the was the big derby. That was the big one all the time. Right. And and did you play in one of those? Was that I did. sort of a, I did. I, yeah. quite I, a frenetic atmosphere, maybe? Yeah, I played home and away. I mean, we, we, had, we, we had about, I think... Eight to ten thousand for for one of those games. Um, yeah. At at that time, I remember. I think we we drew we either drew two two or one three two, 
Mm-hmm. I can't remember exactly what happened. And I remember I kind of, I had a decent chance um, late in the game. Something broke from a set piece and I had a shot from outside the box, which I, to this day, it still annoys me. I didn't keep it down uh, and I should have. Um, <laughs> and, and maybe I could have, you know, I could have gained early glory. But um, but uh, I, I, um, I say I had, I had, a, had a nosebleed as fullbacks often do in attacking yes. positions and uh, I didn't take the opportunity. Yeah, I have a similar thing. I'm still playing regular football uh, and as a centre-back, whenever I go forward, everyone goes, oh no, here he comes, this isn't going to happen. I don't think I last scored in 2021. Um, so what I'm also interested in is, because clearly Johnny Giles was a, an amazing player. He also was a, a great manager uh, at certain points in his career, and he was the Ireland manager, let's face it, for yep. quite a long time. Um, and as you say, he went to West Brom, but he then was in, at Shamrock Rovers between 78 and 83. Um, and he'd moved from quite a small team to Shamrock Rovers when he was a, a young guy. Um, and I believe he's now president of the club, is that correct? Oh, well, he could he could well be. I, I'm, I'm not quite sure on that. But what I'm interested in is, did he, when you got your trial at Liverpool and then got your move to Liverpool, mm. he had done something similar. So he moved from, you know, Ireland yeah. to Man United in 1957. And let's face it, Man United, whatever you think of them, are a big club and they always were a big club. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, before he then joined Leeds for many years. Did he sort of take you to one side and say, right, Jim, this is what you need to do to, you know, it's a, it's a big transition moving from a relatively small club uh, uh, like Shamro, a big club in Ireland, but a relatively small club compared to the big guys over here in England. What was his advice to you? Did, did he say, right, you need to concentrate on this, get this settled? Da, da, da. Um, his, his advice was simple, that... Um... It's much tougher than you think it is. You see them all running out in their lovely kits on, on a Saturday or a Sunday. And you think, oh, it's just lovely you play a bit of football. He said, but there's an awful lot of hard grind that is behind the scenes that, you know, has has to be done. Um, so he said, you know, you need to ready yourself for that. Um, and you're going to have to go through periods of stress. It's just the way it is. Um, yeah. So he, 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 he didn't try to dress it up, you know, in a fancy way. He 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 told me what what it was mm-hmm. truly like. So I I I took that on board and and uh, I thought okay, I'm going to knuckle down and and get cracking. And when you've got people with that much experience, um you listen and um yeah. I'm I'm glad I did. Absolutely. And so let's talk about your move to Liverpool. So that was in 1983 and then you had to wait a little while for your debut because you know, mm. young young player, um, not with with not huge amount of experience. So, do you remember that first deb- first game for Liverpool? Yeah, I do. I mean, you, you more or less had to kind of do a, an apprenticeship um, at Liverpool before you know, if, even if you were being considered for the first team. Mm. Um, I can remember playing away in the reserves and kind of going well, and I then started being taken by the first team, almost being groomed to be one of them. Mm. And um, I was a bit upset with that because it was preventing me from playing in the Central League, which was the Reserve League up up north at the time. And Mm. um, I wanted to play. And then somebody, I can't remember who said, somebody said to me, don't be stupid. Can't you see what they're doing here? You know, they're slowly bringing you into the scene, into the squad. They're giving you a feel for everything. They they know that you've got the potential, um, and they're making you as one of the group. So just shut up and absorb it, get on with it. And yeah. I kind of then the, the penny dropped for me then. Um, but yeah, it took it took about eighteen months for me mm-hmm. to um, to be given my my debut. But I had uh, experiences of being the thirteenth man by then. There was only one substitute back then mm-hmm. in the in the eighties. Um, and they'd always take a 13th man in case somebody fell ill or got injured. Yeah. So, yeah, I started benefiting from that. And um, it was 
I mean, it was just it was just great. I mean, the the, the Liverpool dressing room was one harsh environment because yeah. the standards were so high yeah. that if if you messed up in you know and and the the coaching staff were brilliant at spotting little things, little details. Mm-hmm. But if you messed up at all, then you just got told. I mean, you know, that you, that you, it was full frontal. I can remember going to Coventry at one stage as 13th man and Liverpool lost 4-0. Terry Gibson got a hat-trick. Right. And I saw Terry recently, actually. I mentioned it to him. <laughs> I reminded him of it. And... Um, I remember Alan Kennedy getting getting blamed at half time, and I remember cups flying. There were cups flying around the dressing room, and I'm thinking, "Oh my God, I've got this to look forward to," <laughs> you know. But yeah. that 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 was just a little kind of glimmer of how serious it was. They hated losing, and I mean, it was just, you know, you you had to realize pretty quickly that there was a standard to be set, and and you had to hit it, and you had to hit it like, you know, every ninety minutes, week in, week out. Um, and you know that they, they there were no there were no hostages. <laughs> and it, it was it was full on, and you know I I embraced that. I realised it. I think initially I was a bit um, in awe uh, when I was training with them, and then I soon realised that no, come on, I'm I'm on a par with them now. I've got to grow my confidence, and yeah. and I've got to I've got to convince myself now that I'm 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 good enough to play at this level, and. Mm. Joe Fagan told me at lunchtime on the Friday that I was going to start against Southampton in midfield. They, right. they, they, they thought it. I remember he, he had a word with the, the, the digs I was in, the people that were running that. And, and he told them, oh, yeah, he can play a bit. The boy can play a bit. Um, yeah. So they, they, they played me in midfield. I was never really a midfielder because I was never great with my back to goal. Right. I never felt comfortable with that. I always loved the space that I could run into from fullback. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah Joe Fagan had told me you're in and I, I, there's the worst thing he could have done I wish he'd left it for an hour and a quarter before kickoff the following day and then I could have maybe just okay you know it's, yeah. it's all quick But so I didn't sleep particularly well I got about maybe three hours sleep and I knew all my family were coming over on the ferry to either Hollyhead or Liverpool and I went to meet them uh, at the hotel they were all staying at and I had kind of I had a cup of tea or two with them, I think. I don't think I had any breakfast because I was waiting for my pre-match meal. I didn't want to upset yeah. that. And um, yeah, and again, like my Shamrock Rovers debut, I went out and because I was playing midfield unexpectedly, I again was thinking, OK, don't try and be fancy. Don't overdo it. Just, you know, do the basics well and, and get through it. And I mean, it went OK. I didn't do anything, you know, again, dazzling, but I remember Roy Evans pulling me to one side on the Monday when we were in training and saying, you could have done better on the Southampton equaliser. They could, Joe Jordan got a late equaliser for Southampton. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and and I can remember thinking, you know, yeah, but at that stage, I was just, I was spent. I was exhausted. Mm-hmm. I, I'd gone through, you know, the physical and the, then the emotional because this, the step up to the pace is another thing that people, you know, are, are never really aware of and that the pace of top level football in England um, still the same now in the Premier League was mm. was pretty ferocious so I um, yeah th- everything caught up on me and I did tire at the end and I think that played a part in me uh, not not dealing with the situation better a bit harsh to be blamed when you're playing left side of midfield for not picking up Joe Jordan, or was there something that you know? Because Joe Jordan was a big centre forward, he yeah. should have been marked by Lawrenson or Hanson, surely. Yeah, apparently I I could have anticipated something a little earlier in the move, and I could have got myself into a better position, and I I I didn't do that, and um and and that's that's why I I was I was reminded uh, on the Monday. Well, that's that level of detail, isn't it? It's not yeah. just the goal, it's the stuff that leads up to the goal. And we all have heard about the legendary boot room and I've read a very good book about it. And did you ever, I mean, I don't think players, because it was very cramped, wasn't it? And, and players weren't necessarily involved. It was mainly the manager and the coaches who were in the boot room plotting. Mm-hmm. Did you ever get hauled into the boot room for a quick chat? No. Nope. I mean, I popped in there once or twice um, regarding boots because all (laughs) all the boots were in there. Yeah. So um, my my fear was just getting booted out 
Um, <laughs> so no, no, that that that's that was a legendary place. I mean, everybody kind of you know away managers were all invited in there to have a little little whiskey or a glass of wine before they mm-hmm. they got on the coach to to go home. Um, and of course, you know, um, for 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 Liverpool fans, the boot room was was everything. We all think you know there were these kind of sophisticated chats. There weren't. I mean, everything was just kept very, very simple. You do things in a simple fashion. Mm-hmm. Um, there was there was never any great kind of sophistication involved in in what we did at Liverpool. We just had very good players uh, yeah. working hard and and playing to a very high standard. And um, yeah. you know, and the, the boot room basically planned all that. They they, they were good, Richard. They were good at. Um, Seeing detail, they were very good at spotting little things in in mm-hmm. opposition games. Like I remember one time Kenny Dalglish was told this keeper likes to drift off his line. We're ten minutes into the game and Kenny has a look up and just chips him, you know. And and yeah. lo- lo- lots of other little kind of detail like that. They were very good at at spotting that. And um, what I always remember about my debut as well is the Liverpool Echo at the time. There was a guy called Julio Iglesias. Mm, who had a song him, called Spanish Begin- Singer. Yeah, yeah. Spanish singer, yeah. Who um had a song. I don't know whether it got to number one, but he, he had a song called Begin the Begin. And um the headline in the echo was Begin the Beglin. Oh, <laughs> that's great. Okay. <laughs> I ho- I hope you've contacted Julio Iglesias and asked him <laughs> to send you a signed copy of the record or something. It would have been great, wouldn't it? <laughs> Uh, very, that's very sharp journalism. I, I like that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, going back to this game, uh, so you say it was actually a one or draw. Jordan equalised in the 90th minute. Rush had scored in the 46th. But you look at the team you're introduced to, and quite frankly, there is not one player who's not right at the top of their game. Mm-hmm. Grobelar, Neil, Kennedy, Lawrenson, yourself, Hanson, Doug Leash, Mulby, Russ, Johnson, Walker. I mean, crikey. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, well, that, that's why I, I, whenever I'm asked about Liverpool and when I have to reflect back on things, I always say that my my biggest achievement was being able to get a place in that team, to be good enough to, to get a place in that team. And I remember Dal Gleish pulling me to one side at one stage saying, you know, you're in, you're here because you're good enough. So have the confidence, have the belief in yourself, you know, and, and, um, and kick on. Don't 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 remain tentative, you know. Which I tended to do, kind of tend to just want to not let anybody down. But yeah. there's a big difference between not letting anybody down and freeing yourself up to do what you're capable of, you know, to mm. to deliver your potential. So um, so yeah, I I'm I, it's a badge of honour for me. Um, I'm I'm very proud of the fact that I I was good enough to to get in that team, and um, you know, even when I go to Anfield, still people. People remember me, and they they mm-hmm. remind me about it, and it's 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 lovely. It's lovely to uh, to hear that. Absolutely. And do you remember any of the? So, if you were playing left midfield, who who are you up against in the Southampton team? Because again, they had some big names. There was Chilton in goal. They had. I remember Mark Dennis was one of the most terrifying players I've I've ever seen. Yeah, because yeah. he actually, because I'm a Palace fan, so I was, he he spent a little time with us, and mm. every time he thought, "Oh my goodness, he yeah. can tackle quite harshly sometimes." And then they had Mark Wright, and they had Mick Mills, and see Joe Jordan who scored. So, was there one opponent on that team where you thought, "I need to really nail this person"? Well, or, or cover them. It was Mick Mills. It was uh, Mick okay. Mills. Mick Mills was playing right back. Yes. So I have one of the most experienced guys in in English yeah. football, and you know I've and I always thought as well. I kind of knew it because I started off at, at like so so many people think they're going to be goal scoring wingers. When I was a kid playing for Waterford Bohemians, mm-hmm. um, I started off thinking I'm going to be a, you know goal scoring winger, yeah. um, but I quickly realised that, or maybe the coaches did that. I didn't quite have the footwork to be able to kind of you know, get round people, the fancy footwork that you need to do to get past good mm-hmm. players. And I didn't really have that. And I think it was the same then. You know, I was always looking before Mills could get to me. I was always looking to just kind of lay the ball off because I knew I didn't really have the skill to be able to to go and, and, and take him on, you know, mm-hmm. and all that experience. So, um, yeah. So, again, it was kind of, um, it, was a, it was a safety first 
thing for me. But um, yeah, and, and playing a lot was was. Did you say? Did you say Shilton? Shilton was in goal. Yeah. Shilton in that team as well. Yeah, I mean, I I can remember subsequently playing against him um, when we played the semi final of the FA Cup mm-hmm. in '86. And yes. I got through. I got through kind of in a one-on-one situation. I thought I'm going to hit it early. And I smacked one. But I was like thinking, I, I smacked it because there was nowhere to go. He looked huge. <laughs> it, I mean, his angles were brilliant. Yeah. You know, and, and I mean, he he was, you know, he, he, he wasn't thin. He was like, yeah. you know, a, a bit bulky. And, and I just remember getting through and thinking, Jesus Christ, you know, how, wh- wh- where, where am I going to, where am I going to place <laughs> yeah. this? So I just absolutely smashed it and he, he just beat it away easily, you know. And, um, yeah, be, being in that kind of territory, you know, with, with um, amongst names, big names, it's mm. something that you have to you have to overcome as well. You have to dismiss. You have to think, well, you know, they're not they're not that great. Something that Bill Shankly, who, who you know, always did that in his time, playing them yeah. down, trying to G his players up. And, you know, I, I, I had a little bit of that as well, you know. Yeah, I think it's interesting what you say about sort of going for the safe option, particularly when you're making your debut or you're making your way into the team, because sometimes you see players trying stuff that is a little bit too complicated early on. And I, I absolutely you know, endorse what you say. I think that's what you need to do. You need to keep it simple, be aware of the issue, dangers and just play, you know, not fancy football, not extravagant, just fit in. And then I see gradually you build it. And as you say, you build your confidence. You then start a few more things to be a bit more adventurous. So I, I totally get that. So looking again at this this point in the Liverpool season. So this was 10th of November. So we're a little way into the season. Liverpool had just lost to Everton at home, who were towards the top of the league. Liverpool were 12th at the, at the time of this game. And I don't know, do you keep programmes you, from your previous games? They're, they're all in the attic. They're all in a they're suitcase in the, in the attic. Yeah. Well, I've, I've got the um, programme wow. from this yeah. game. And, and I will send it to you so you don't have to go up to the attic to get it. I, I, I have that one. Oh, you do have that I one? I do have okay. that one. I do. And it's, yeah. it's very interesting because... In the sort of programme notes, it's saying, well, you know, it's not all doom and gloom, guys. We're 12th. We could get through this. It might be OK. And, you know, guess what happened? You ended up, you know, at, at the top of the tree. But it's, it, I think, the the next season is the one that obviously made a huge impression on football because you mentioned Kenny Dalglish. He took over as player manager then, um, from Joe Fagan. So going into that season, you, you you played a few times, but then you became a pretty regular uh, member of the lineup, didn't you, for 85, 86? Yeah. Um, yeah, I can remember when, when I played that game against Southampton, I then went and played in a World Cup qualifier in Copenhagen uh, for Ireland. We right. were beaten 3-0 by Denmark, Michael Laudrup and Preben Elkjar, those guys. Um, and I suffered a, a knee injury. Mm-hmm. Um, I hurt my knee. Um, and you had to kind of report injuries very quickly. So I, I went straight in the next day when I got back and reported it. And then I think we were playing Newcastle away um, the following week following weekend and I, I was ruled out. I, I couldn't play in it. So I spent a little bit of time out of the side. But then um 84, 85 in the lead up to the European Cup final um in Brussels, Heisel, um Alan Kennedy suffered an injury. So I was back in again and I managed to play uh, quite a few games be- be- before the end of that season. Um and then Kenny Dalglish as the new manager offered me a new three-year contract. Right. Um, nice. So I then realised that, okay, I think Phil Neal and Alan Kennedy are likely to be moved on now. And uh, yeah. myself and Steve Nicholl would basically fill the, the full-back roles or the, mm-hmm. the wing-backs, which we played now and again. Um, yeah. And and that, that, eventually, that eventually did happen. So, yeah, 85-86 um, yeah, 
will always be kind of um, precious because of the fact that we did the double. We should have been the first English club to win the domestic treble. We lost in the semi-final of the League Cup, the Littlewoods Cup as it was, to QPR over two legs. And um, yeah, that that was that was that's something that continues to grate with me as well. We we um, we ended up losing one nil in London, and then we went back to Anfield and drew two two. But everything went wrong. We Jan Malby missed the penalty, which is just yeah. unheard of. No, Gary Gillespie bad. got an OG. I kind of knocked the ball off Ronnie Whelan for another OG, and it was my fault. So we we made we made stupid errors, mm-hmm. and then on the Saturday. We we played them again in the league QPR and we beat them four nil, you know, and that's that's the way it should have been. And I can remember because of the mix up I had with Ronnie on on one of the goals for QPR. Um, mm. We'd always sign a ball and then we'd go and kick it into a part of the stadium. Right. And I went across to the the far side, um, which is now the Sir Kenny Dogley stand, and I boosted the ball into the crowd. And as I turned around to, to go and warm up, some scouser shouted at me, pity you didn't do that on Wednesday night, Beglin. <laughs> oh, that makes you feel at home, doesn't it? <laughs> love, love the scouse wit. Um, yeah, as you say, won the double. And ironically for the team across uh, Stanley Park, you, uh, Everton were both runners up in the league and also lost in the FA Cup final. Um, just double checking. Did you play? You played in the FA Cup final, did you? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So again, was that your first time at Wembley as a player? Um, oh, oh, I'm to, I, I I might have played for Ireland against England there. We lost two one to England. I'm, right. I may have I may have been there just before that. I think in the spring. In the home championships were of eighty six. No, I mean it was Northern Ireland, wasn't it, for the home championships? But oh, we weren't sorry. really yeah, part yeah, of that. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I think it was just a friendly. Um, right. But um, I, yeah, I can't remember the day. I think it might have preceded it. Yeah, mm-hmm. it might have. So I, I wasn't, I wasn't as daunted. I mean, I, what what I would say, you know, having played in a European Cup final as well, and mm-hmm. I've one that nobody likes to kind of look back on. But I, mm-hmm. I think the FA Cup, and I know Jan Mulby has said this. I, I think that the, the FA Cup was a bigger bigger deal than than um, the European Cup. I, I genuinely and and that I can remember that final. There were people risking their lives trying to get in. I mean, the, the official attendance is given as ninety eight thousand. I bet you there was about one hundred and ten thousand in that stadium that day. And because it was Wembley, it could cope. It it, yes. it could take it. It could handle it. Um, but there, there were guys that were kind of jumping, they were leaping great lengths in the hope that their mate would catch their arm and they wouldn't plummet to the ground and things like that. I remember seeing all the footage from that. I mean, the, it, the FA Cup final was everything back then. It was enormous. It was yeah. ginormous. And, you know, it, it came on TV. We're, we're in the hotel that morning and um, BBC and ITV, and they start running yeah. the, the whole day. It, it would go yeah, yeah. ten you o'clock know. in the morning. That's the yeah, start, yeah, all the way was, through. It was quite incredible. You know, none so, of these uh, five thirty kickoffs either. It was a three o'clock kickoff, and yeah. that, that was it. But, um, so it, it was lovely for me to have been a part of all that. Then, mm-hmm. I mean, I think it's changed now, and it's still important, but it's it's of I would suggest lesser importance. Yeah. But um, but back then it was it was everything. Absolutely, absolutely. In the programme as well, it's interesting because they talk about the World Club Championship, which was coming up the following month. So um, I don't think you played in the World Club Championship, but it was against no. Independiente, who are Argentinians. And I always like looking at the you know the picture. So they actually have quite a big section about Diablos Rojos, which is obviously the Red Devils. But when you look at their team, they have got some pretty tough-looking guys in there. And, you know, Argentina, I don't want to stereotype them, but they tend to have some pretty rugged defenders. Did you travel out there? Because it was in Tokyo. Did you travel out there with the squad or were you left behind? No, I, I, I mean, exactly what year? Are we, are we talking 85 or 86 now? This is 1980. Hang on a minute. So this would be 1980. 
84, actually. Oh, 84. So, so this that, was after that was your before. debut. So I, I, could, I can remember being summoned to Manchester Airport where the lads right. were all staying before we flew out to Tokyo. Mm-hmm. And um, and because everybody had announced themselves as fit, um, right. I, I was stood down and I was sent back and I, I played um, some reserve football. But I, 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 didn't, I didn't get to go. But I can remember Liverpool players um, saying, you know, that they should have treated it more seriously back mm-hmm. then. It, it was kind of um, just a, a, a little jaunt, um, and yeah. they, they, they didn't, they didn't go go about it as professionally as they probably should have. And I think some of them kind of have a regret for that. Um, but you, you could tell as well sometimes, you know, I remember like when we go, I remember we played in Dubai one time, played against Rangers, the unofficial British championship, the Dubai Cup. And um, you could tell that the, the, the coaching staff were relaxed. They weren't really that yeah. bothered. They weren't because no, normally they'd be kind of giving you advice, detail, shouting at you, whatever. Now they were just very relaxed and taking it easy. And it was almost like it was kind of a little holiday. And I think, it probably shouldn't have been around Tokyo at that time, around Japan, but it yeah. it 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 did. Um, it unfortunately it, it it was treated kind of as a step down, and and um, yeah. I don't think Liverpool ever kind of won it back then. No, I think the South Americans treated it much um, yeah. more seriously, and I think yeah. they won far more against the European champions than. Mm. Most, uh, you know, I think it was sort of like seventy percent South Americans because they 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 took it seriously. I wanted just to touch on a couple more of your first as a, as a as a player, and then I just want to move on to your transition to becoming co commentator. Um, I'm I'm sure you remember this because I actually looked it up and, and managed to see it. Your first goal uh, for Liverpool in a European match. Yeah, and I believe Jonathan it was Eichels. quite an important game, wasn't it, Jim? Yeah, just just um, four nil against Panathinaikos. Yeah, and the semi final, first leg of the European Cup. Um, it it was lovely as well because it was it was manufactured on the training ground. Oh and, right! And again, they were very good at spotting things. They realised that. Panath and Icos tended to just run with players and not really kind of bother too much about the ball. It was just about stopping opposition. Um, so if we got a free kick, I was told to look as if I was disinterested. I was just loitering around outside the box and I'm not yeah. I'm not going to be part of the set piece. Um, and then everybody would run to the front post and then I would suddenly have to come to life and get in on the far post. Yeah. So... Um, Excuse me a second. No, no, no problem. Yeah, every, every, everything start, starting to, to, to ring. Um, but yeah, um, so they've, they've all darted to the front post and I have come around the back and one of them realised at the last minute that they'd all been duped and he tried yeah. to kind of get back. But um, I think it was Sammy Lee ran over the free kick, Doug Leach mm-hmm. clipped it to the far post and I just came in on it and caught it, caught it perfectly. I couldn't have got it any better. And um, it's always again precious because that was my only goal at the cop end. Yeah. And so um, I, I remember the following night. I lived in West Derby in Liverpool at the time, and mm-hmm. I went to the local chippy, <laughs> as we call it. And yeah. I went in, and the guy who's a kind of Italian guy, and he started shouting at me, saying, "You, I'm not serving you." Go, you know, go out. I'm not serving. Last night, he said, I had a hundred pounds, a hundred pounds wow. on three nil, and oh, you gosh. pop up. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Yeah, and, <laughs> that's and so unfortunate. He he did he did serve me in the end, and I think he gave me a few extra chips. But uh, right, you know, yeah, I, I, you, when I, you ruin I, someone's betting slip, it does hurt, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, um, yeah. Well, I, but I, it was a great I, header. Far post in, in yeah. it went. Yeah, oh, did yeah, you score many uh, headers in your career, Jim? Not, 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 not a huge amount. I mean, I, I, I could head a ball, um, and I, you know, I, I grew up making sure I could head a ball. There, mm. you know, b- b- better than many. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I, I wasn't renowned for for popping up there. Usually on set plays, I would kind of take up a much deeper position. 
But yeah. that was just one of those kind of situations where they thought um, they could capitalize on on, a, on free kicks on set pieces if if mm-hmm. um, if if we got it right, you know. And um, and and that evening it was, and it's just a lo- lovely feeling, um, yeah. you know. I I think we b- would have been okay to go through with three nil. We went over to Greece for the second leg and one one nil in Athens mm-hmm. with sixty thousand in the stadium. We were probably lucky to keep a nil scoreline because they they had a couple of efforts I think that hit the woodwork, but mm-hmm. but we were we were far superior to 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 that Greek side. Yeah, yeah. As you say, great to score at the top end in such a big game. I mean, that's mm. been fantastic. So yeah, I just wanted to move on to the transition. So as as I mentioned in the intro, you unfortunately suffered a really bad injury against Everton when um, Gary Stevens. Uh, basically, gave you. I, I saw some comments from both Bob Paisley and Alan Hansen saying it was one of the worst tackles they'd ever seen. So you never really fully recovered from that injury, and you, as I say you ended up going to Leeds, but didn't play that often because mm. your knee was then uh, susceptible. And, and we all know that if you've got that sort of injury, it is very difficult to recover. And, but, do you think particularly in those times, do you think, let's face it, sports science has moved on massively and, you mm. know, rehabilitation and you've got all specialists. Do you think in terms of what could happen now, do you think you would have come back or do you think it was irredeemable? Um, I, I I think I, I may have struggled. I mean, I, I, mm. I broke my left leg um, in my rehab um, and then once I got back onto a football pitch, um, they were playing me in midfield, trying to get me fitter. I remember playing Manchester United at Anfield, and I turned just to help um, a ball up the pitch. And mm-hmm. as I turned, um, my cartilage tore, and um, you know, I, I eighty percent of my cartilage had to be taken out the next day, my lateral cartilage. So that was the problem then. I had bone on bone in my knee, and yeah. so um, I, I knew. I knew I was probably going to be up against it. I was never quite right after that. If if mm. if I hadn't suffered that injury, I think I might have been okay with the brilliant job that was done on my my broken leg. Oh. But um, but nowadays you even though you know you can replace livers, kidneys, lungs, you name it, hearts, um, a piece of grizzle in your knee, mm. um, it's 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 almost impossible to do it. They still haven't perfected matters. Yeah. So. Um, I, I reckon I'd probably be still in a yeah in a a poor position in terms of you know trying to get back fit. The one thing I'll, I'll say on it all is that um, I've had to compartmentalize that and put it away because I didn't want to yeah. be bitter for the rest of my life. But no. it, it it's a, it's 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 something that um, I gave everything everything to try and get back on a football pitch and to try and get back to a standard. I knew I might never be able to play you know, top level again, but may, mm-hmm. maybe a level down. And uh, and I think my stint, once I was fit to be able to get on a pitch with Leeds, um, you know, I did okay at times. I, I, yeah. I, I was I was fine and I could get by. But I by then I was playing with the fear of breaking down, the fear mm-hmm. of my body not being able to hold up again. So I, I'm, I'm happy with myself. I, I don't look back on it with any regrets because I, I gave it everything I could to try and get back, you know, my fitness. And yeah. um, and so it, it didn't work out. And I, I had to retire, sadly. But um, but there were other things in store that I, I, I hadn't realised would be there. Exactly. So uh, bouncing back from that huge disappointment, you made the transition into the media. And I, I, I remember seeing something where you said that you originally got offered some stuff with Radio City in Liverpool and then you actually got um, Howard Wilkinson encouraged you when you were at Leeds to get involved yeah. with the local radio, Radio Air, was it Was it not? Yeah, it was Radio Air. I, I, the, the guy I have to blame for all of this is a guy called <laughs> Gabriel Egan with RTE yeah. in Ireland because he'd okay. interviewed me after Ireland games. Uh, he was a radio commentator. Um, mm-hmm. For RTE, and yeah. I think he suggested during my injuries towards the end of my career, he suggested to the bosses, the powers that be at RTE, that I come on board and I do some some cocom. So mm. I I began doing some stuff with RTE and developing things from there. 
And I can, yeah, I can always remember when I, I went into Harold Wilkinson's office and he put it to me. He, he'd heard me once or twice on Radio Air. And, yeah. you know, he, I think that the, the line was, you can put a sentence together. <laughs> um, so he put it to me, you know, what about a career in the media? And, and I went, oh, gaffer. I said, I've never, I've never even given it any thought. You know, yeah, I've done a little bit with RTE and Radio Air and Radio City. I said, but, you know, that's in, in my infancy. Um, yeah. And then he, you know, that kind of stuck in my mind. Um, and as it turned out, because of what I, I had already done, that then began to develop and, and the phone started ringing a little more and Granada um, got in touch with me. And because I had done a piece for a Leeds Liverpool game, I was working for RTE doing reports. Right. And then um, I remember being interviewed by John Inverdale on Radio 2 um, yes. as, as a former player for both clubs. And so a guy from Sky Television then rang me, a producer, and I went on a couple of shows at Sky and it's just kind of seemed to, to spiral from there. Off, mm. off, off we went. So, um, yeah, Her- Herod Wilkinson, he, he got yeah. he got it right. Yeah, he got lots of things right, didn't he? Um, both yeah. within football. Uh, uh, so, it, can you remember the first game you actually co- were co-commentator both on the radio and on the television? I, I would say um, it would be Ireland versus somebody. Um, I, it could it could have been the old Yugoslavia, I, or it's a Yugoslavia or Romania, I think mm-hmm. in in Dublin, um, and exactly when I'm 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 not not entirely sure, but um, yeah. I I think you know it 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 goes back to kind of I spent a lot of time injured with my broken leg, and I'd been part mm-hmm. of Jack Charlton's um, team before that, and because I couldn't play, I think you know it it, it takes it. Takes me right back to to um, to maybe 1980, right? You know, and I remember doing it Italian night. I mean, no, sorry, I, I I got that wrong. 1990, I yes. think I remember. I remember doing um, Italian 90 as well with um, right. with with RTE Radio. So okay. yeah, so um, it it just it just spiraled from there. It was it was kind of great. I just started getting kind of contacted from from everybody and. Um, and then I, I, I kind of realised that I, I had done a report for Liverpool Nottingham Forest for Granada Television. Mm-hmm. Elton Wellesby and Rob McCaffrey would be in the studio in Manchester on a Saturday afternoon. It's kind of like right. what you see on Sky now. And um, I think that they were trying to kind of unearth the next pundit or, or whatever. So I went to Anfield and it seemed to be received well. And on the Tuesday night, I found myself sitting in the studio in Manchester now, I never really wanted to be on screen or in the right. studio. Yeah. My, my love was always CoCom. Yeah. And because um, I think in, in a studio, you get some great analysis. And you know, I'm not knocking mm-hmm. anybody for that. You get some great punditry. There's no, no doubt about that. Yeah. But you also, there's an awful lot of conjecture. There's an awful lot of speculation and you know, questions that kind of didn't really kind of hit home for me. Um, whereas when you're sitting in a stadium and you're looking down on a game, you're looking down on fact, and then yeah. you give your interpretation of the fact. And that's what I, I've always been drawn to. That's what I've always loved, to be in that atmosphere, to be kind of in the moment and, and, and calling it. And, um, and you know, I, I remember as well, um, one of the producers at RTE pulled me to one side and said, look, if, you, if you're going to go down this co-commentary route, you're going you're gonna to harm your career. You're, you're going to damage your career because you're you're more or less saying you're giving up on punditry, um, and I just said, well, I, I I would disagree. I said I think there's plenty out there for me to be able to, mm. you know, to go on and and develop what I'm what I'm doing, cocom wise, and um, I I think I think I was proved right. I, I don't yes. think it, it it kind of influenced things negatively for me uh, mm. at all. Well, thirty odd years later, you're still doing it. So that proves. Well, I, I, keep, I, keep, I keep I keep waiting for that, Richard. I keep waiting for that <laughs> little tap on the shoulder. You know? Yeah, and Cocom. So when you started doing Cocoms, was it similar to when you started playing, where you said, "Keep it simple, don't do anything extravagant." You know, have that you know slightly more conservative with a small C view of what you're going to say, rather than trying to do anything particularly florid or poetic. Yeah, I, I mean, when, when I made the move from radio to television, I found it difficult 
because you know now all of a sudden I've got a director in my ear kind of who's talking to me directly um mm -hmm. you know when I, when I was doing like the B BBC radio I started doing a lot of five live stuff um mm -hmm. as well that you know you, you would hear hear what was going on but I could no ignore a lot of it in my ear um and not have it as a distraction because basically they're talking to the commentators beside me and sure. and not necessarily me but then all of a sudden I've got a director telling me guiding me mm. and, and they oh okay um and I I found it difficult and of course looking at the monitors you know the, the whole package was different and yeah. I I I wasn't it wasn't a smooth transition for me I I I had to kind of work at it a bit. I had to get through quite a few games before, you know, I began to feel much more comfortable about things. But then, then that happens. You find a comfort factor, and then you can relax, and then you can kind of bring your your real character to to what you do. And um, and you know, it, it's it's changed. It's changed hugely from when I started. For example, there was no social media. I mean, if I if I I can remember if if I was starting now in the fashion I did back then, I'd I'd get rinsed on on social media. I'd be absolutely pulled apart. So um, yeah, that, that 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 has changed enormously. And the fact that now you have to be, even if you've got like a a great um, relationship with the person sitting beside you, and you're more or less kind of finishing one another's sentences, you've got to be very very careful. In picking your words nowadays, because you, you so easily you can upset somebody, and you know you can end up being cancelled. We've seen you know a, a lot of people, and I have um, slipped up on a couple of occasions and maybe said something that was wasn't well received. Um, but it's it's never been done deliberately, and it's never been done callously. You know, it's something that's just kind of popped out in a moment. Um, but now I try to, because of my experience, and I try to just buy an extra second. If if that will help me not say that yeah. word, you know, or that phrase, or whatever, and you know, you've you've got to be careful. So that there 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 has been an awful lot of change from when I started. Absolutely, and I think one of the key things to commentary is the chemistry between the main commentator and the co-commentator. So you know, I've heard you co-commentating with you know likes of John Champion, Peter Drury, et cetera. And it works. And, you know, there are lots of co-commentators uh, out there, but, you know, that chemistry to me is the most important thing that you you get on and, you, as you say, you sync almost. So you're not talking over each other, you're not repeating, but you you know what each other's thinking and, you, you know, you can prompt each other in a way. Is that the way it goes? Yeah. yeah. Well, you get you get so familiar and, you know, my my first job is not to um, talk over the commentator. It's not to step on his on his toes. It's just to keep away. So th there there's a discipline in in what I've got to bring to it in in terms of in and out. And and like I I just think ne never talk for too long. Sometimes you you can maybe um, develop a point you're trying to make and and take it into the game if the game allows you to do it. Yeah. But but the, you know otherwise I tried to keep it very short and and even so much so where is it he's just said something beside me then I'll just come in with two words or whatever mm. just to to try and describe something or add to something um, like that but I I've always kind of sought for that because I think initially when I came on board my boss in in RT in Ireland would say you know um, you don't have to come in much just come in when you've got something incisive to say mm. you know and and. You know, you, that that was almost like a threat, and um, and now now it's very conversational. It's it's mm -hmm. it's changed. It's it's kind of flipped over, and um, and it's it's lovely when you've got that back and forth going, and you know yes. you 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 think you're kind of you're 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 getting it right. You're you're getting to the point, you know, and and you're you're reasoning things out, and and it's mm -hmm. it's it's working. But um, but yeah, listen, I I've been very very lucky to be in the company of some of the, the guys you've just mentioned now and, and the likes yeah. of Clive Tilsley, George Hamilton, you know, the, the George Hamilton I worked with for Ireland. And, you know, the, these guys, I've learned from them. I, I've learned about, you know, how they go about their business. And I thought, well, hang on a minute. Okay, my job is analytical, but I can still, um, 
you know, make notes. I, I can make pointers. I can just put stuff down. And I like to do that now because I think if you write stuff down, it kind of tends to stick in your head a little better as well, you know, right. to call upon it. And it, it depends. Some days you've got not the greatest game, um, you know, a game that needs a goal. Um, and you can look down and you can maybe, you know, make some analytical point about things. There are other days where the whistle blows and you never get a chance to look down. And I love days like that. You, yeah. you, because you don't need to because it's all happening out there and it's a great game of football and you just kind of invest yourself in it and, and go with it and um, and hope that you're you know you're more or less correct on on most of the analysis so yeah. um yeah so I, I've um, I'm lucky to still be getting away with it well I hope you don't get that tap on the shoulder Jim and I'm sure it is it's not happening um but it's been an absolute pleasure having you on thank you very much for your time and that as usual, I enjoy the little aspects of the journey. So starting off, as you said, not being too ambitious playing and then developing your, your skills. Never a great goal scorer. I like, I like the fact that you, you, you've got your modest uh, part as well. And then, yeah, I do, I do love, probably my favourite story is the one where you're booting the ball into the crowd as a, as a sort of pre-match thing and the guy goes, why didn't you do that on Wednesday? But uh, thank you very much for your time um, and really appreciate it. And as ever, I, I love having people like you on to it started with a kick uh, and let's hope uh, you continue to commentate for us uh, over the years to come. Thank you, Richard, and thank you for inviting me. I've enjoyed it.